can here with n. This is DC lesson one, part B. So about this lesson. This lesson we're going to introduce you to the terms of voltage, current, and resistance. So let's say three new concepts. There's a fair bit of uh, learning to do with how we label these things and some of the conventions that we use. We're going to start with discussing the difference between a conductor and an insulator. So as we do all of that, we're going to use the uh, textbook by Phillips and this is chapter 1.4, and 6 and it's worth having the textbook with you as we go through the slides. Now it's important to note this visual metaphor and you can see here uh, what looks like a blue pipe or something. It's, uh, that's our conductor and we have Mr. Volt pushing some current, that's Mr. Amp through the conductor and all the time Mr. Ohm is trying to slow that process down. So that's a nice little visual that we'll be using as we go through the slides. So the first thing we're going to introduce you to is voltage. Now one of the ways we do that is by giving you a, another metaphor to uh, play with. Well, this in actual fact it's more an analogy and that is of water pressure on a, with a pump. So you can see here we have a pump. I'll just try to turn my pointer pen on. So here's our pump. And it's spinning around obviously and as it spins it sucks water up, spins it around and then pushes that water out the outlet and it does so at a particular pressure. And there's our analogy for voltage. So pressure equates, and I use three parallel lines, that's the symbol for equates, so pressure equates to voltage. Very important to understand. So a voltage is electrical pressure that's the important thing to understand here. Voltage is electrical pressure and it occurs between two points if one point has more or less electrons than the other. So again, that's what we're doing here with our battery. And you can see we have a positive end and a negative end of the battery. And the battery is providing this electrical pressure. So we have in here electrical pressure and it's being applied across the terminals. So at the moment we're talking about this guy. So this is the electrical pressure. So the analogy is the pressure of the pump or the electrical pressure of the battery and in this particular case you'll notice it's a 12 volt battery. So the pressure that we're being applied here is a pressure of 12 volts. So what are electrons? Electrons are negatively charged particles of an atom that circle around the outside of the atom. So an atom That's this whole thing here. This whole thing is an atom. It's made up of protons in the middle and it's got neutrons. So it's protons and neutrons and spinning around the outside are our electrons. And you can see we've got a little negative symbol in the middle indicating that they have a negative charge and the protons have a positive charge. 
You'll also note that these electrons are spinning around the outside at different amounts of distance away from the nucleus. So these electrons that are in close are called tightly bound. So, so they are tightly bound. But electrons that are spinning way, way further out, say this guy out here, he's loosely bound. So he's loose. So he's loosely bound. So the further a distance an electron is away from the center of the nucleus, determines on whether it's tightly bound or loosely bound. So voltage between two points. An electrical pressure and electrical voltage happens when we have negative on one side and positive on the other. So it's a balance of electrons, not the charges themselves. So on this side, you can see we've got lots and lots of negative electrons. On this side, we've only got a few. So lots, a few. So there is a voltage when one point has more electrons than the other. So there's a voltage or sometimes we call this a potential difference. So a potential difference, I'll just go D I double F so you know what I mean. Potential difference and that's a voltage. So when you have more electrons, it's negative. We have less electrons, it's positive. Now I know that's counterintuitive, so it's important we get that set in our heads right now. When one side has lots and lots of electrons, it's negative. When it's got only a few electrons, it's positive. So you can see the color difference here. We've got black equals negative and it's got more electrons red equals positive and it's got less negative or less electrons. So it's about how many electrons we do or don't have that determines whether something is positive or something is negative. And when we look at the positive and a negative in relation to each other, it's called a voltage source. So what's voltage in EMF? Voltage is measured in volts, named after Andres Voltaire. So Mr. Volt, it's named after. The symbol we use is the capital V. So uppercase V for volts. The voltage from a voltage source, such as a battery, is also called an EMF or an electromotive Force. So electromotive force or EMF battery potential difference is a few terms that we use. The symbol for EMF is we use a capital E when we're using the term EMF. When we're using voltage, we use V. So next, the next thing we're looking at now is current flow. And again, 
we're using our water flow metaphor. So I'll just turn my screen pointer pen on. And here we have a pump creating pressure. So we've got negative pressure here, positive pressure here. So water is sucked up into the pump, pushed through the pump because we have a negative pressure compared to a positive pressure, comes out through the tap, and in this particular case, we've got it flowing back into the tank. So this flow is called current flow. So here in the back, here in our uh, electrical example, here on the right hand side, remember we have 12 volts of pressure, but this pressure is now forcing current to flow from the battery into the lamp, up through the element, back, out, down the black wire and back to the battery. Now as that current passes through this very thin tungsten filament, it actually gets hot. It gets so hot that it glows. And the glow emits light. And it's called an incandescent lamp. So as that gets hot, heat is produced, it glows and produces light. So the current is actually doing work. It's also important to remember that current, when it flows through a circuit, does work. And the work in this particular case is heat and light. So current is the flow of electrons, which we'll look at a little bit more closely before too long. But for now, our analogy is our water pump produces a pressure difference. So negative on this side, positive on this side. Water is drawn out of the tank, up through the pump and back into the tank. And that water coming out the tap, that's where the work is done. And there is a current flow. So our battery is like the pump producing a 12 volt pressure causing electrons to flow up through our conductor through our element back through our return wire and back to the battery and as the current flows through the element it gets really really hot it glows white hot and light is produced and that's the work that the current does. It's a very important concept that you get early on that current does work. Voltage does not do any work. Voltage helps push the current, but it's the actual current that does the work. So next, we have our current flow. And again, here we have a battery. We have current flow and we have electron flow. And you're going to say, can they're the opposite to each other. Well, you're absolutely right. Over a hundred, little over a hundred years ago, when uh, people like Voltaire and uh, Michael Faraday were discovering electricity, they were thinking of it inside the battery. And they thought that outside the battery, it flowed from the positive to the negative. But in actual fact, that happens inside the battery, but not outside the battery. So on a battery, the electrons flow this direction. So that's the electrons flow this way. But conventional current flow is the other way. change my pointer to a different color. So 
current flow or what we call conventional current flow is positive to negative but electron flow is the other way around it's negative back to the positive so current flow is all about this guy in here so here's Mr. Current that's this guy in here so Mr. Volt he was the battery and Mr. Ampere being pushed through the conductor and in this case the light Mr. Ampere is what does the work poor little bugger in our picture he's the one who's actually doing the work so current flow again just to reiterate conventional current flow is positive to negative but electron flow is negative to positive so for all intents and purposes in most of the electrical industry we just stick with conventional current flow and we say it goes from positive to negative because that just seems to make a bit more sense in our heads so current and coulombs current is measured in amperes after a French physicist mr. ampere the symbol we use is the letter I so we don't use the letter C because unfortunately C has been used for electrical charge called coulombs so for now current is the letter I capital I the symbol for ampere is the capital letter A that makes sense A for ampere and one ampere of current equals one coulomb of charge flowing for one second so if you make one ampere flow for one second you've created one coulomb of charge and a coulomb equals that huge number so 6.240 times 10 to the 9 it's no 9 10 12 so 6.24 times 10 to the 12 electrons so a coulomb is that many electrons and we use the symbol Q is the letter for charge now we're moving from our volts we've gone through current now we're up to Mr. Resistance for current to flow there must be a path for the electrons all materials can be classified as conductors insulators or semiconductors that's the three big categories a conductor is a material that lets electrons flow pretty easily because of its atomic structure so it's got loosely bound electrons lots of them that we can use to carry our electrical current so let's have a quick look at our atomic structure of copper copper is a very typical thing that we use and you can see here's the structure of copper and here's our nucleus here in the middle and it's got protons and neutrons and then these things around the outside these circles are called valence shells that colors not too bright I'll use a brighter color so we have valence shells around the outside and the scientists have Call these shells K, L, M, and N. So, as I was mentioning before, if the electrons are in here, they're tight. 
tightly bound. But if the electrons are out here, they're loose. So they've got loose electrons. So a copper atom is made up of 29 electrons orbiting the nucleus in four shells of K, L, M, and N. And copper has a valency of one because it has one spare electron in that final outer shell. So, electron flow is us being able to move a charge along those electrons. So if you have a copper conductor, as here we've kind of got brown colour representing, and we've got an electron being pushed into the conductor here. So here's our first electron coming in. It pushes an electron into this atom. Now there's too many electrons in the outer shell, so it pushes one out into the next one, which then says, oh, too many, thanks, push that one out to the next one. It says, oops, too many, push that one out into the next one. Oops, too many, push that one out, and so on and so forth. So we start from the negative side, and the electrons flow across to the positive side. So that's electron current flow. In a conductor, electronic electrons can easily move from one atom to the next because they have a low valency number. So the lower the valence, the more spare electrons there are floating around the outside of each of the atoms that allow us to actually bounce charge, literally, from electron to electron to electron. So conductors. Conductors include most metals. So most metals have a low valence and spare electrons. Silver is the best conductor by a long way. Copper is the best, best conductor and is widely used in the electrical field because it has some other properties. It's easy to um, find. It's easy to work with. You can actually extrude it and it stays elasticy. Where if you extrude silver or hard work silver, it becomes brittle. So copper has some great advantages in its other mechanical characteristics apart from its electrical characteristics. Gold has less conductivity than copper, but does not corrode. So gold is a pretty good conductor, but one of its um, great things is it's inert, it doesn't interact with anything else, and therefore it's non-corrosive. So again, one of its other properties can be of a great advantage. Aluminium is a poor conductor, or poorer conductor, I should say, than copper, but being lighter, it's used in high voltage transmission lines. So when you've got to string those big cables up over hundreds and hundreds of meters at a time, they are done using aluminium cables, because they are much physically lighter. Now to insulators, kind of the exact opposite. An insulator does not conduct electricity. If the voltage is high enough, an insulator can break down and become a conductor. And normally when it breaks down, it breaks down permanently. So air is a good conductor, but if you've ever seen lightning, even air can become a conductor. So lightning's an example of air breaking down and becoming a conductor and you see light being emitted. You don't see the electrical current flow, but you see the light that's produced. Most insulating materials are destroyed when they break down. So as I mentioned before, if an insulator breaks down, it often destroys the insulator. Semiconductors as their name implies, a semiconductor is neither a conductor nor an insulator, or we could say it's both an insulator and a conductor at the same time. The most common semiconductor material is silicon. There is another one called germanium. When these two semiconductors are doped, they can be used to make solid state components such as transistors and diodes. So when we add an impurity, that's what they mean by doped, 
into silicon. We can make them conduct when we put a current through them in one direction, but we can actually make them insulate if we put current through the other way, and that's called a diode. So let's look at comparing resistors. Here we have a continuum. So it's just a line. And at this end, we've got conductors, things like copper. And at this end, we've got things like insulators, like glass and mica. And somewhere in the middle, we've got semiconductors. So semiconductors, most common things we make semiconductors from are carbon, silicon, and germanium if we add some impurity to them. So you've always got to remember we're adding and I'll just go IMP, you'll know what I mean, impurity. It's got to be added to those to make them a semiconductor. So our conductors, like I said, are mostly metals. So things like uh, silver, copper, and gold at this end, and sometimes aluminium in high voltage installations. And at the other end, one of the great insulators we use often is air, uh, paper, glass, mica, and one that's left, left, off, left off the list here, which I think is important, we've got oil. So mineral oil in particular is the important insulator that's used in transformers. Our final element is resistance. So resistance is the opposition to current flow. So it's not an active thing. So we could see voltage here as being active, providing the pressure. So that's kind of active. And we've got current, poor old Mr. Current. He's providing flow. So he's active. But we're now going to deal with resistance, which is the opposition to current flow. And he's called Mr. Ohm. So this is resistance up here, Mr. Ohm. And he's passive. We call him passive. He's passive. I think passive's got two S's in it. So he's passive. So we've got on active voltage trying to push Mr. Current, Mr. Amp, through a conductor. And Mr. Ohm is trying to prevent that as much as he can. Resistance is measured in ohms, named after George Ohm, and we use the symbol R, R for resistance. The term ohm is often replaced with the Greek letter omega, but quite often we're just happy with R, and a resistance of two ohms would be written R equals two omega or ohms. If a voltage doesn't change, so as long as the voltage is constant, the higher the resistance, the less the current. So that's one of the attributes of what we call Ohm's law, which we will get into in some lessons that come along very shortly. But for now, it's you must remember, the higher the resistance, the less the current. So the more that Mr. Ohm can reduce this space in here, the less current can flow. So the more Mr. Ohm can restrict that distance, it means the less Mr. Current can flow through. So that's what they're saying here. If the voltage doesn't change, so as long as this is constant, so as long as Mr. V here remains constant, and Mr. Ohm 
it's bigger and bigger, making this gap smaller and smaller, then Mr. Ohm has less space to get through, therefore the current will be less. So that's the end of lesson one, part B. I hope you've enjoyed the second part with Dr. Ken.